and warm welcome to everybody. I'm very pleased this meeting is taking place. I'm Stephen Timms. I'm the MP for East Ham. I chair the Work and Pension Select Committee in the House of Commons and also this all-party parliamentary group on immigration law and policy. I, I just want to start by thanking uh, the Open Rights Group for putting this event uh, together, thanking Sadia in particular uh, and your team Sadia. Sadia does have quite an unusual combination of expertise on data privacy on the one hand and migrant rights on the other, which is just what we needed for this event. And, and thanks to um, all the, the panel members, to Jim Killock, who's the uh, long-standing executive director of the Open Rights Group, been there for 11 years, um, who will talk about the wider policy uh, context. Uh, Cassie Roddy Molino, who's a solicitor at AWO Data Rights Agency, who will be making a presentation to us and give us a, a legal uh, perspective. Luke Piper, who's the head of policy at the, uh, the 3 million, speaking on behalf of EU citizens in the UK, who will be setting out the impact on, on them of digital only immigration status. And Malia Babjak, who's the London project officer at the Migrant Rights Network, who will talk about unlawful data sharing between the, the Home Office and HMRC and the impact that's had on highly skilled migrants who the Chancellor has just announced in the budget we're very keen to attract to the UK. Um, can I just remind everybody to keep microphones muted during the panel session and um, whenever you've got a question please submit it using the, the chat on Zoom and we'll have an open Q&A session at the end that Sadia will, will chair. I just wanted to say a few words at, at the start about this all-party group on immigration law and policy. It was set up last year. It aims to examine bringing together legislators and practitioners the challenges in this area, including you know, looking at the hurdles that migrants in the UK are facing. At the inaugural meeting um, a year or so ago, I, I spoke about my concerns then about current migration and asylum policy. Everybody now accepts that the treatment by the Home Office of the Windrush generation was a disgrace. There's been a government apology, compensation scheme put in place. Uh, the Windrush Lessons Learned Review has been published and it highlighted very starkly some deep problems both in policy and in culture which have been pervasive in the Home Office for a long time and awful hardship has been inflicted as a result on people who've been falsely accused of cheating in English language tests, that's one of the groups we've considered, um, and on hundreds of highly skilled migrants as we'll be hearing later on in this meeting. Um, the Home Secretary accepted the findings of the Windrush Lessons Learned Review. She promised to implement its recommendations in full. The Home Office then set out its intentions in a pretty striking document, which it called a comprehensive improvement plan for itself. That was published in September last year. There was a foreword with a, uh, an endorsement from the Home Secretary setting out uh, encouraging promises, righting the wrongs, a more compassionate approach, openness to scrutiny, uh, and so on. But I must say that nobody who's working with the consequences of Home Office policy has as yet reported any sign of those commitments being translated into actual change. And much of the APPG's work since then has focused on migrants who have been targeted by the Home Office, having done absolutely nothing wrong themselves, it's, it's quite difficult to see any sign of this comprehensive improvement that the Home Secretary promised. And there is now real worry that we're talking about this afternoon about the Home Office plans to make greater use of data sharing. Um, data A New Direction was published by the government on the 10th of September. It promises, I quote, an ambitious pro-growth and innovation friendly data protection regime. It's nearly 150 pages long. It includes in particular perhaps proposals to make it easier for different law enforcement and national security agencies to share data. Consultation underway at the moment. Response is due by the 19th of November and it's the impact of those changes that we really want to, to consider um, today. We're going to start with a video and then we're going to hear from each of the four panellists. Um, I think Sadia might allow me to uh, put a couple of questions to the panel 
um, after that, uh, and then she's going to chair a, a wider Q&A session that um, everybody can take part in. But let's see, first of all, if we can successfully show the video. Thank you, Stephen. So we're going to um, start with a short video. It's just a couple of minutes um, that shows how that was produced by us and is available on our website, produced first um, earlier this week. And it shows how GDPR privacy laws protect us all. The government says it wants to scrap protections against data discrimination. The law called the GDPR protects women, workers, patients, ethnic minorities, and LGBTQ communities from prejudice and bias. GDPR empowers Uber workers to stop robo-dismissals. Ditched in the new proposal. GDPR protects migrants against the Home Office's racist labelling in immigration applications. Binned in the new proposal. GDPR protects students against mutant algorithms judging their A-levels. Dumped in the new proposals. GDPR means victims of domestic violence ended the police's digital strip searches. Ditched in the new proposals. GDPR protects job applicants against racist recruitment algorithms rejecting non-Western names. Deleted in the new proposals. GDPR stops gambling companies from preying on gambling addicts. Erased in the new proposals. GDPR punished Grindr for sharing LGBTQ users' information with advertisers. Removed in the new proposals. GDPR empowered NHS patients to challenge Google DeepMind seizure of medical records. Cancelled in the new proposals. GDPR punished Bounty UK for illegally selling records of mothers and children to data brokers. Dumped in the new proposals. GDPR lets users challenge Facebook for exploiting your vulnerabilities such as anxieties or state of mind. Stopped in the new proposals. The GDPR protects us all. We have until the 19th of November to make our voices heard. We need individuals and organisations to stand up against data discrimination. So let's move on to the panel. We've asked uh, each of them to talk to us for five or six minutes, uh, starting with Jim, who's been executive director of the Open Rights Group since 2009. Thank you very much. I'm going to do is just take you through a little bit of what the uh, government is currently doing with data policy. So you get a little bit of an idea where this is all coming from. Now, obviously, the the big context here is Brexit. Uh, post Brexit, the UK has a lot more flexibility over a, a very large number of policy areas. And for just for Brexit to be justified, if you like, the government needs to find ways to diverge from the current standards and look for competitive advantages. And given that we're a service economy, and given that we are, uh, you know, have a very big growth sector in the digital sector it makes some degree of sense to look at data policy uh, from the government's perspective um, however what it's done is it's basically said well what we need is innovation and growth and the way we do that is by loosening all of the regulations i'm sure this is a pattern we will see in other areas of law whether that's employment environmental standards um, innovation will be pitted against uh, the current frameworks. However, that's a very short-sighted policy uh, because you always want consumer trust and you don't get consumer trust if you loosen all the regulations and, and, and put people in a position where they lose uh, control, oversight, transparency over what's happening to them in whatever sector that is. And with data, this is particularly important. Um, the government uh, has basically wrote a um, consultation, uh, a policy document called the National Data Strategy, which signals this departure. It also pushes for international data flows, um, and it makes the strong claim that the government wishes to maintain high standards of protection. It has to make that claim, partly if we want to maintain relations with uh, data flows in Europe, but also you know, for this to be at least sound like a same policy it has to make that claim. Um, however, we don't think that it in any way uh, reaches that standard of protection uh, that would then guarantee trust. So what the government has said uh, in relation to this national data strategy, which uh, they, they published their response to the consultation this 
uh, early this summer, around about May. They said, we must now take action to assure that we make the most of data's many opportunities. And they've said also, uh, we domestically, we have the chance to change the narrative of data from one where we uh, emphasize the risks to one where we see the also see the opportunities um, that data makes a create that means which means creating a regime that doesn't just um, emphasize privacy but unleashes the power of data across the whole of the economy and society. So ultimately, the, the policy is pitching that data privacy protections are a barrier to business and need to be balanced, so to speak, or reduced or whatever you might want to say in order to allow data to flow more freely. Um, and that really is the pattern of what we see in this document. Um, the government is seeking to deregulate certain areas within this data protection, and that's now this current uh, consultation, while again claiming they will continue to have high standards. But in practice, what they actually do is gut the rules, in our view. So um, it allows the, the consultation, the GDPR consultation, which is called Data A New Direction. Um, it allows many kinds of public and private uh, data use without considering the impacts on individuals. So at the moment in data protection, you have to think about the impact on individuals when you start to use data, particularly if you're doing it um, without their specific consent, which is what government does all the time. It doesn't need consent to use your data. It just has legal and other justifications. And the government tries to remove the need to balance the rights of the individual and the impacts on the individual with what the government is doing. Um, and that will permit discriminatory and unfair outcomes, which today we can legally challenge or are likely to be stopped as a result of GDPR. Um, it also reduces the need to assess how data is used. Uh, so there are less sort of safeguards, data protection impact assessments and other things which check whether data is being used sensibly. And it places barriers in front of people who are seeking to access data about themselves, including payments. Um, and you'll know from, I'm sure, many, many simple examples of just trying to understand what the government is doing or why a decision was, has been made. Often access to data is the first step towards getting justice for people extends across many many fields and it also reduces or removes the independence of the independent of the information commissioner which i'm afraid to say is another pattern uh, in the current government's work that they seek to make uh, regulators answerable to the government rather than to the laws that they're seeking to enforce and they do this by essentially making all of the policies that the ico puts forward pass through the minister before they get to parliament and by making the ICO appointed by a, a body that they can essentially stitch up appointments for. So there's, a, there's already problems with the way the ICO is appointed, but they intend to make this a lot easier for governments to be able to essentially influence and decide who, who the information commissioners are. So between all of those things, you don't have an independent regulator. You can't always get the data you want. It's very hard to challenge things. Um, the way data is, is used isn't going to be looked at and assessed. And even if there are discriminatory and unfair in, outcomes, it doesn't matter because it's legal. That's basically where you are. So, uh, you know, from that point of view, this sounds pretty dreadful. Uh, we'll go into the um, more today about how that plays out in the migration space. Um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll hear a lot from the practitioners here too about the sorts of things that they're observing. But because of all of that, we really need everybody here to be thinking about responding and explaining that data rights are important because there are real world outcomes. Uh, you know, I'd even point out that the Windrush scandal is at heart of data protection breach. Uh, you know, that's about data being mishandled, abused, destroyed without permission, without thoughts to the accuracy of the information the government has. That you know, should tell us that data matters, but of course this goes into many, many other areas. We'll hear more from other people about that now. Thank you.
Thank you, Jim, very much indeed. That's very interesting. Um, let's go on to Cassie then, who's a solicitor with AWO, which is a new agency uh, working internationally to shape uh, and imply, apply and enforce data rights. She's recently led a project about police reliance on automated systems and the potential for discrimination that can arise uh, from that. And perhaps, Cassie, you could just start by telling us what exactly a data rights organization is. Thank you. Can you hear me now? We can. We can. Yeah. See the slides. Great. Um, yeah, of course. Um, no problem. So I am, uh, my name is Cassie Roddy Mullineau. I'm a solicitor and a litigator with AWO, who are a new data rights agency. And I suppose the best way to describe what AWO do for our clients is we provide um, a holistic offering of not just legal services, although we are a fully regulated law firm, but we also provide um, consultancy and research and public policy services so that when clients come to us, we really give them the full um, 360 on um, data rights and information rights. And we work across the whole whole gamut of those rights. So um, I'll begin the presentation now. And thank you so much for inviting um, me to be here today. It's a real pleasure to have this chance to speak with you. So in my presentation, I'm going to address how the UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act can be a really useful tool for migrants' rights organizations. And I'll also speak a little bit to the DCMS's um, proposed reforms to the data protection rules. So firstly, uh, really just to start with the basics um, and what these laws cover. So these laws cover most situations in which information about an individual, which is known as personal data, um, is used or processed in some way, so it's changing my slides, um, by some other person or organization who are known as the data controller. And controllers can be public or private entities, and there can be more than one controller involved in data processing. And it's important to mention that the UK GDPR is grounded in respect for fundamental rights, including an individual's right to protection of their personal data. And this is really important to flag because fundamental human rights are not commodities, they can't be bought or sold. And the UK GDPR sets out um, some key principles that you can see on the slide, and these have to be complied with by organizations when they're processing data. And these include that all processing must be lawful, it must be fair, it must be transparent. It includes that data collected for one purpose should not then be used for another purpose, that data have to be kept accurate and up to date, and that data has to be limited to what is necessary for the purposes of processing and not go beyond that. And organizations who process data are accountable for demonstrating compliance with those principles. And when we consider maybe the known issues with processing of data in the immigration context, then the need to demonstrably comply with principles such as transparency, data accuracy, purpose limitation, and data minimization become very significant. And so these principles uh, flow throughout the entire UK GDPR and they translate into very strong rights for individuals and obligations for organizations. And so starting off with rights. So the UK GDPR gives individuals rights over their personal data. And these include the right to be informed if, how, and why your data is being processed and also by whom, there's the right to access your data and get a copy of that data. There's the right to have inaccurate data corrected or deleted. And I think that is particularly significant because as Jim has said, so many migrants have been impacted by inaccurate data pro processing in the past and will continue to be. And also the right not to be subject to automated or algorithmic decision-making without human involvement. So computer says no type of situation. And conversely, controllers have a range of obligations, and these include uh, specific obligations, such as the duty to conduct what's known as a data protection impact assessment, or a DPIA for short, when they're engaging in high risk processing. And DPIAs are used to identify and then mitigate against risks, including risks to individuals. 
And that includes considering if the processing could lead, for example, to discrimination against individuals or otherwise in fact, or interfere with individuals' fundamental rights. And then if the risk cannot be adequately mitigated, the processing should not be proceeded with. So it's uh, quite consequential. So individuals can enforce these rights and obligations if they're not complied with. Uh, generally, there's three main options. There could be a complaint to the regulator, which is not always the most effective route, or individuals can bring a public or a private law action through the courts. And with private law actions in this area, there are interesting options. So for example, it's possible to get a court order to cease processing. And there's also po the possibility for representative actions where an organization such as a migrants rights organization can bring a case on an individual's behalf, including for compensation. And finally, to discuss some of the ways which the UK government is trying to change the rights and obligations that I've just spoken about. So firstly, there are proposals to reform the access regime. And these reforms would make it more difficult for individuals to request data including through introducing a fee regime. Uh, the regime at the moment is currently free. And as many people in the room will know, um, prior events to, or prior attempts rather, to dilute the subject access regime have had very negative consequences. So for example, migrants who tried to get access to their data were frequently refused it on the basis of the immigration exemption, which has since been ruled unlawful due to the great work of org and the 3 million who challenged that practice. And in our experience, SARS are really key to exercising other data protection rights and often what is a lack of meaningful transparency. And so many of the cases we bring at AWO on behalf of clients just start off by individuals questioning, what are you doing with my personal data? And without access, individuals cannot have their data corrected or deleted when it's inaccurate or they cannot properly challenge unlawful data processing practices. Secondly, there's um, a suggestion to remove the data protection impact assessment duty, and this could really remove an important tool that migrant rights organizations could use to hold unlawful data processing. So in the past, uh, AWO have successfully challenged data processing operations for clients where DPIAs were not conducted, and as a result, the processing had to cease until the proper safeguards were put in place. And uh, lastly, of the reforms I'll speak about, um, there are suggestions to remove the right to a human review of wholly automated decision making. And as we all know, decisions by algorithms are becoming more common, including in the immigration context. Um, so this right really recognizes the increased dig dig uh, digitalization, hard to say that word, um, of our society, and it seeks to provide what is an important safeguard. And so rather than removing it, um, there's really potentially room to make this right more meaningful. And in response to the consultation, the ICO has in fact uh, suggested that rather than removing it, the right should be extended to partly automated decision making to reflect the reality, which is that humans often uh, place a large degree of trust in machines, even when a human is involved and that more consideration should also be given to ensuring that a human review is actually meaningful. So in conclusion, um, I really think it is important to think carefully about the consultation and to make submissions because the human impact, as Jim has said, of these changes to our rights, such as, for example, introducing a fee for the SAR regime is really important. And I've left some contact details there. So if anybody wants to speak further or they want some more information about these issues, um, please do get in touch. And I can also take questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie, very much indeed. That's very, very interesting. Um, let's move on then to Malia, um, who manages London-based projects for the Migrants' Rights Network. Um, recently, she has been uh, supporting advocacy for the highly skilled migrant group, uh, group including some of my constituents who were denied indefinite leave to remain because of alleged very old tax discrepancies relating to their self-employment. Um, and we had a, a specific meeting on this topic a, a while ago, but um, Malia, over to you. Yeah, no problem. 
So since 2018, um, the Migrants' Rights Network have been working with the highly skilled migrant group, as you said, who originally came to the UK as part of the highly skilled migrant program. Um, this was replaced in 2008 by the tier one general visa. Um, and under this scheme, uh, migrants could engage in self-employment um, or employment without sponsorship um, as the government sought to attract the brightest and the best. In 2014, um, this scheme was shut down as part of the coalition government's aim to reduce net migration to 100,000 um, after a, a monthly cap uh, on numbers was found to be unlawful. So all of the highly skilled migrants, um, they were en route to settlement um, and they'd begun to apply for indefinite leave to remain. Um, but uh, starting in 2016, the UK government um, has refused indefinite leave to remain um, to 1,697 highly skilled migrant visa holders uh, because of these historical uh, tax discrepancies um, and in the process dubbed them all as well of being of poor character. The highly skilled migrants and their families um, were left in limbo in the UK and have um, experienced significant hardships uh, as a result of this. Um, through a series of high court challenges and uh, our intervention, both legally and politically, the number of highly skilled migrants um, that has been affected has significantly reduced. Um, but there remains a desperate number of individuals um, and families that are affected. Um, and they are here um, and they remain to overturn the Home Office's initial decision um, that they had been deceitful, um, intentionally misleading um, and of bad character. Um, for their tax discrepancies, um, which are, are neither a criminal um, nor an immigration offense. Um, the historical tax discrepancies, uh, which were used to deny indefinite leave to remain um, to these migrants, uh, we believe these to be based on unlawful data sharing um, between the Home Office and HMRC. Um, there is no lawful agreement in place that allows for the data sharing that currently takes place um, between the Home Office and the HMRC about individual highly skilled migrant cases. Um, the terms of the, the Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU for data sharing uh, between HMRC and the Home Office, um, which we access via uh, freedom of information requests, um, they provided no evident uh, lawful due process um, or safeguards for sharing the data um, that was used to refuse uh, indefinitely to remain um, to these highly skilled migrants. Um, the discrepancies in question, um, they do not amount to uh, the offenses that are described um, in the MOUs which permit data sharing. Um, refusals that were as low as £1.30 um, appear to support this. Um, similar examples of data sharing um, between government agencies uh, have been used by the Home Office, um, you know, such as with uh, NHS Digital and the Department of Health um, having been successfully challenged as unlawful for breaching um, patient confidentiality and being discriminatory to non-British um, patients. So we're now exploring um, a legal channel uh, to the data sharing methods uh, between the HMRC and the Home Office with lawyers at Foxglove. Um, and we're also exploring possible breaches to the Equalities Act as well. Um, a background survey on the uh, migrants that were affected told us that they had been living in the UK for at least 10 years. Um, nearly all of them held a postgraduate degree uh, from the UK. Um, since paying you know, significant international student fees and tax, uh, nearly half of the remaining um, group without leave uh, are experiencing destitution and homelessness. Um, many of those uh, that we work with had um, no right to work, rent, or recourse to public funds, um, and COVID-19 only further exacerbated their insecure uh, situations. Um, additionally, uh, these you know, data sharing immigration enforcement issues um, between HMRC and the Home Office have a real uh, racial element to them. Um, so all of the remaining cases, um, ongoing cases, are of Commonwealth migrants of color, um, from six South Asian and uh, African countries. Um, from the evidence gathered as well, um, all those that were refused indefinite leave to remain uh, for historic uh, tax discrepancies are non-white. Um, before the uh, indefinite leave to remain refusal, um, neither HMRC um, nor the Home Office investigated whether these discrepancies uh, meet their own deliberate or um, carelessness threshold. 
So in many of these cases, the Home Office was actually reopening um, cases that had been resolved with the HMRC up to a few years prior. Um, and many of the remaining cases uh, have still not you know, been given the opportunity to explain these through what's called a minded to refuse letter. Um, and for those that did receive the minded to refuse letter, um, these letters have been designed to be extremely onerous um, on the applicant to answer. Um, there's been some movement since we started advocating um, and individual cases are being granted uh, leave to remain. Um, however, the high school migrants um, will not be exempt from this affecting their future immigration um, applications. Um, to conclude as well, amongst you know, many needs, um, I think we, we urgently need greater clarity on the data sharing processes um, and the profiling of uh, the non-white highly skilled migrants um, that, were, that was used to refuse and definitely leave to remain um, so as to ensure that you know, this doesn't happen again. Um, this is only one example um, of where data sharing practices can go very wrong and can cause uh, significant harm to our communities. Um, so overall, we are very you know, fearful that um, within the government's uh, data new direction plan that this will cause further um, discrimination to migrant communities. Thanks. Thank you, Malia, very much. I'm sure there'll be some questions about, about that in a minute. Um, so finally, to Luke, who's the head of policy and advocacy at the 3 million representing EU citizens in the UK. And for them, digital rights has been a, a very important concern since uh, the 3 million was started. How, how many EU citizens do we think there are living in the UK, Luke? I, you, Stephen, you couldn't resist make, get, making a gag at the name. And you, and you it, it's, some, it's something with parliamentarians and not being able to resist making a gag at the three million's name. I don't know what, well, the, the estimated is very likely to be six million people who will, right. will end up with, I think that's, it's likely that we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see that. So yeah, probably going to need to have a rebrand, but I think <laughs> it, it highlights the, uh, the sheer lack of intelligence and insight into the population of uh, not just EU citizens, but migrants generally in the United Kingdom uh, and uh, their presence and their value and so on and so forth. So I think um, it, it's uh, it's more of a kind of a, a lesson really to, to how bad the data actually is on, on, on populations in this country. But I'm gonna be as brief as possible because I'm quite conscious of the time and I know that people will probably want to ask questions, but I was originally billed to speak about the digital only immigration status. Um, I'm sure most of you that. who are uh, on this call are aware of uh, the fact that the, home, the UK government is now uh, insisting that migrants uh, under the EU settlement scheme uh, to be able to access and prove their right to live in this country need to access a digital only platform via an online portal, which I just posted the link for there in the chat. This regime is currently uh, closed to those who have status under the settlement scheme, so it's EU citizens and their family members. So it's millions of people who are, have went from simply using their passports to navigate living in the United Kingdom to only being able to do so using this portal. Um, this regime will be rolled out to all nationals. Um, the ambition is by 2024. So there is a lot to understand and a lot to learn from this digital learning framework. I should say that um, we've got a lot of other concerns in terms of practice and there's a lot of work that we're doing with regards to data sharing arrangements, data uh, accessibility and data protection issues generally with the Home Office, but specifically on digital status, it is a new horizon in many respects of how the Home Office and how the government will use immigration control um, in this new digital sphere, um, because digital only status um, not only does it have the function online functionality, but to be able to use it, you need to give information to the Home Office um, to be able to access it. So not only does the Home Office have a batch of information about your life in terms of what you told them when you applied and other intelligence that they may have gathered through other sources, this is a new uh, sort of living 
data acquisition entity that whenever it's used, it builds this continuously building this profile of you whenever you use it. So if you are looking for a job, your employer has to input where you're, where you're going to be working. If your landlord is using it, they have to input it. And there's no doubt that this will be evolving and developing as time goes by. Um, so why is this important? Um, just to kind of really punctuate the point. Um, what these blocks and this information that's being acquired um, is or is being used and will be used to be shared with other, in, other departments internally within the Home Office, but also across government, and also to local authorities and other contractors um, for whatever purpose that they feel is necessary. Um, and history has taught us that, as, as was just discussed, that Windrush is a clear example of where bad data, bad information is used in a bad way for bad purposes. And we're very concerned that, again, we will see that practice replicated um, across the populations of people, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of people who are being subject to this uh, regime. Um, so it's when I say bad in in sense of all the horrible things that it results in, but also in the just in the sheer incompetence in the way that it's been dealt with um, data acquisition, management and curation by the Home Office is notoriously bad. Um, and that is uh, not restricted to the EU settlement scheme. And there's a lot of work that we've been working on recently about data sharing practices between HMRC, DWP and the Home Office to identify and terminate EU citizens' welfare benefits if they haven't applied to the settlement scheme. The reality is, is that they're now chasing after people who are British citizens, um, not people who haven't yet applied. So there's clearly things that are going very wrong and there is scope for this to go wrong in the future. But turning to the topic at hand and linking this to the discussion that we're having here today, this is going on now with the GDPR regime in existence. Um, problem is, is that uh, it's challenging still, even now to hold the government to account with the fantastic framework that we have. We've only been able to scratch the surface of where things are at the moment. For what we've been, what we've seen is been, we've used powers like the data, like the obligations for data impact assessments and all of the duties that flow from from that, um, as well as the other caveats and things like that that prevent protect people when exploring these issues. If those go away, um, it will push even more so these practices and this culture um, behind the scenes. So it is essential for anyone working in the migration sector to actively work with fighting for and defending the GDPR um, and indeed all of the rights framework that comes with that. And the final thing I wanted to say is um, this is all very doom and gloom. I mean, it, and I always say technology is not an evil thing. It's how you use it and what the information is that you use it for. A rights based framework is the thing that protects people. And that's why it's so damn important to hold people to account against that framework and protect it. Um, and it's important to kind of place this in the political context that it needs to be put within. Um, the EU, the you know, guardian of GDPR, has you know, I know there's lots of problems with the way in which they guard it. And I know Jim has, you know, will wax lyrical about that quite happily. But the, fun the fundamental reality is, is that the EU is very worried about the way that the UK is drifting away from GDPR. Indeed, in the, um, oh, whatever, I forget what it's called now, the, oh, the recognition thing that they did, but we're just completely lit, lit from my brain. But the, in their, uh, in, 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 in that act, um, they, attached conditions to the UK, which are not done with any other country where they've done recognition uh, under GDPR, um, purely exactly because of these concerns. So we have to engage not just internally with the political adequacy, thank you, Jim. Um, so yeah, the, the EU attached a number of conditions to adequacy, which is never done with any other country where it's gone to consider adequacy. Um, so it's really important that we not only hold the government to account and uh, really have a, a, a very healthy debate and discussion about this within the UK context, but that we, ele we, we uh, elevate this to an international playing field with the European Union and the partners on, on the other side of the channel, because I can tell you now, 
they have economic and political interests in protecting their GDPR framework um, from the UK's uh, more looser interpretations of what that might look like. So um, there's a lot to play for um, and um, it's scary, but I think there's a lot, uh, there, there are some glimmers of hope just by the geopolitical forces that are really behind all of this. Um, so it's, it's really important that we do everything we can to uh, protect what we've got already and not not lose any more. So, yes, sorry, I prattled on more than I should have done. Um, sorry, Steve. No, not at all. Thank you, Luke. Very helpful and interesting. Uh, Sadia, can I, can I just put one question then? I mean, picking up Luke's point that IT is not in itself inherently um, evil, but I just wonder, Jim, whether, I mean, do you think there is scope to sort of make some changes to this regime to enable innovation as the government says it wants to do without the damaging impacts that we're talking about today or do you think in reality you know as soon as you try and do anything very very much you're going to run into these problems well i think uh, of course there's, there's always scope the, the question is who is trying to exercise that scope um and i think you know i and bluntly i i wouldn't really trust this particular government with that process um, and that's because, you know, the their instincts come from uh, some, you know, a number of people around previously around Dominic Cummings, for instance, who are mm -hmm. uh, very libertarian against government regulation in, in general, who think that the, 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 the benefits to society come from big business doing what it needs to do to deliver services and, and, and through the profit motive purely and, and not through uh, balanced approaches to the way that we develop society rights and data use together. So I, I think the instincts are in the wrong place, and that's part of the problem. I also think that despite what Luke's said, and I think what Luke said is valid, but there's a element of this government that would really like us to fall out with the EU over data. Uh, not only is it more headlines, but it's, you know, more bad things that they can do and, and damage they can do to the European Union's um, international standing. And so I, I worry about that. Um, of, of course, there are tweaks. I just just really <laughs> don't think that the mm -hmm. government wants tweaks. It wants radical change. Um, I, it has a proposal which is very uh, incoherent in my view, um, but that incoherence leads to danger. They, they're basically just grasping for things that say that business will get more profit. And I don't really think they're thinking very much else through carefully, which is what would be required to meet the kinds of change we're talking about, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Sadia. Okay, so thank you very much, Stephen, and to the panelists. Um, we're going to move to a short question and answer session now. So um, what I would ask you to do is to use the raise your hand function, um, which is if you go, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there will, there is reactions. And if you click on that, you'll see raise your hand or you can pop your questions um, in the chat. So please go ahead. Can I raise one more while we're waiting? Absolutely. Um, this is a question for Malia. You mentioned that uh, Migrants Rights Network is thinking about uh, a legal case over the data sharing between HMRC and the Home Office. I mean, it just can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like, I mean, are you committed to doing that or are you kind of exploring it? Where have you got to? And if you do do it, when when's it likely to happen? Because presumably, if if the government makes the changes they're proposing here, then your ability to do that will be significantly curtailed. Yes, that's right. Um, we are looking to do it as soon as possible. We've sent um, a proof reaction to the Home Office and are okay. awaiting documents, but they have not sent these documents yet. Um, so it's in it's in the process. Um, but yeah, you've taken the first the first steps at least, so have, that yeah. the Home Office knows that this is. On that's the right. Cards. They are very much stalling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we don't seem to have any questions in the well, chat. I, I've got one more, Sadia. Yeah. Sorry, oh, for, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> indulging myself here rather. But this is a question to Luke. Um, you, you, I think I understood you to say that you've, you, you know of instances of people being denied their benefits on the grounds that they are EU citizens who don't have pre-settled status, uh, but actually they're UK citizens. I, I just be, I mean, from the point of view of the select committee that I chair, I'd be very, very interested to 
know about that because I hadn't heard about that happening before. Is, is that kind of documented somewhere or is there a report I can see about it? Or Yeah, so um, hopefully one of my uh, colleagues will very kindly find the independent piece that was uh, published, um, which which we, we worked on with the journalist May Bullman. Um, I, I should say, uh, uh, Stephen, that um, th this is currently the subject of some uh, sort of legal wranglings at, at the moment, but the dust will settle soon and then we can, you know, hopefully talk a little bit more about what is going on. Um, but the, the reality of where we are at present is that the UK government um, essentially conducted a data matching exercise to identify these people in bulk, not individually, just in bulk. And then they will say at the end of, uh, well, the, the date's been moved now, um, but uh, big, in a few weeks time, a few days time, sorry, they will then be able to start suspending people's benefits who they believe um, haven't yet gone on to apply for status. So um, if you read the independent piece, it's, it's a quite clear picture, but what I can do is um, when things are a little bit clearer, I'm happy to circulate to you what what's, you know, been going on. I'd be really interested. And the committee, the committee of the whole will be very interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Luke. Okay, so we have a couple of questions now, but thank you very much, Stephen, for your for your questions to the panelists. Um, so we have Rita Chadha, who's asked um, panel members, um, apart from robustly responding to the consultation, is there anything else we can collectively do? Um, Jim, would you like to answer that? Yeah, so I think in the medium term, we've got a period of time where uh, there is there is a need for greater consultation from DCMS and the government, and they'll be trying to form their views. Um, the DCMS have spent a fair amount of time reaching out to privacy organisations to get a lot of uh, feedback from them and also to business, but I don't really think they've reached out much further than that. And the impacts, as, as we've been discussing, are far, far wider. So I think one one really concrete thing would be for uh, groups like yourselves to ask DCMS directly to be consulted and to hear the concerns of your organizations about limitations to government accountability over the use of data. That would be a first step. And the second thing, which I think a number of the organizations here are already doing as the um, Migrants Net uh, Rights Network and uh, 3 million uh, are certainly doing this but but it's to consider how you can exercise and use your data rights today because the more they're used the easier it is for us to build a case that they're necessary and to make that to politicians um I, i'm really very hopeful that the, the, as a sort of a third thing i'm really very hopeful that we can build the case for the lords for the labor party and the liberal democrats to really push hard on, on this as being a, a fundamental part of the things that we value as a society. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's sometimes a little bit easy for people to be a little bit dismissive about GDPR because they don't understand quite how important these, these protections are. But to my mind, this is, you know, GDPR is a fundamental part of our equalities framework. And it, that's something that everybody should be concerned about and all politicians should be concerned about. Because if this goes, you know, we, we end up with, you know, very, very clear cases of discrimination, bias and discriminatory outcomes in our society that wouldn't be there if we'd retained the, these frameworks. So I think it's about that, it's about building the political awareness of the role that this is going to play in a digital society and the dangers of removing those protections. And that's done, as I say, through direct lobbying, at, but also through exercising your data rights and be, being able then to show to people that this matters. It isn't theoretical questions of how balancing tests are made. It's about people having their jobs and immigration status denied. Those are very different things. Um, but we have to be talking about those concrete examples. So there's be a few things, obviously for the consultation response itself, um, you know, we, we've got a web page up there which starts to give some information about how to respond and tries to take the practical and the theoretical together so you can make a response to, to DCMS. 
Um, but yeah, I think it's about after Christmas, really, what we do uh, in the new year up to spring. Thanks, Jim. Um, this is a question which I think relates to the the question that I've that um, Rita asked, but um, just to other panel members, um, Zoe from JCWI has asked if there's plans from members of the group. So I know that Org will be responding, but are there plans from any other members of the group to submit evidence? Um, and perhaps we could share some of the briefings uh, being submitted. Yes, yeah, we, we will be. Um, and the, I think uh, um, what we're hoping to do is um, borrow from the guidance and the, the, the substantive response that you guys will be doing, but incorporating our own examples and our own experience to date of why it's so important. So the things that I was talking about earlier. Um, so the, 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 my intention is to, um, to, to well, I say my intention, because I'm obviously going to be the one who's writing it, but that's given that way, isn't it? Um, our intention is to, uh, is 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 to is is to do that and and but particularly drawing on on examples because I think the 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 problem is that so often this is discussed in the abstract and I feel that that is a is a big challenge for a, for normal people as well as parliamentarians to really get to grips with this as a topic and I think if it's placed within the context of what is happening and why it's important where examples where it's used, been used and so forth it'll be really really invaluable so I, I think that's a a point not just for those who are concerned about migrants rights and things like that but also beyond the scope of this conversation um it, it, I, I i do feel that if there are some clear points then you know people will see it see see this more than a, a conversation about cookies and you know whatever nonsense the, the the minister um was 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 putting in his in the release um but that's that's a, a Big challenge, Jim and Sadia. <laughs> it is, if I, if I may, I mean, this is kind of why we did that video in the way we did. You know, we wanted to pick real strong examples of, of where discrimination has been combated directly with with uh, with GDPR. And, and, and some of those are kind of, you know, they're not all about the migration sector, but I think they're, they're reasonable ones to draw on as parallels. And many of them are, are about racial discrimination in particular. You know, think about the Uber drivers who, uh, you know, facial recognition technologies were used to deny them work, um, basically because of the color of their skin. Um, and, and equally, uh, you know, using algorithms to dismiss people from their job at Uber. I mean, those are just two examples. There are many, many others. Um, and we've discussed some of the ones that here. I, I agree with you completely about using the, the, um, the concrete examples. And the other Thing that I would just say is I, I know doing a response like this seems like uh, something where we're not going to get listened to and and for sure any individual response they aren't going to listen to that but 30 or 40 responses from the immigration sector 30 or 40 from uh, groups working with uh, discrimination disabilities equal other equalities issues that does start to make a difference because suddenly there is a large volume of organizations who are understanding that this underpins their work and that messing with it is going to cause them more political trouble than you know being able to persuade everyone that they'll have less as you say cookie tick boxes thanks jim so we have a couple more questions um in the chat um and please feel free, like panelists, to mute yourselves if you if you want to answer those. Um, so one is, are there any tips uh, to increase potential to be heard in these uh, in in this particular consultation? I think Jim perhaps has already given quite a few <laughs> tips, and Luke as well. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think it's also important. And the framing, the, the the narrative is really important in this as well, is to be positive about what these rights do, right? Because the, the I think so more often so often than not is it's very much an assault on something, which it, it naturally it is. It's people being discriminated and so forth. But I think it, it is more about having a trying to be positive and. Uh, uh, 
about what these rights deliver and framing it in that context rather than being oh isn't the government an evil twisted bunch and yeah you know they're just out to you know mass mass merge information and do whatever i i i, and I appreciate that that is a, a challenge but i think more you gain more um by by doing that because they are essentially taking things away and i do i think that's there's some slight framing things here as well which are really helpful um it's just it's very different it's, there is a balance i i, I appreciate but that, i i think um yes I, I, I just that's hopefully that's helpful so there are two more questions that i want to fit in quickly so i know like panelists will have to be really quick with their with their responses um so the first so one was from tracy gyatang and the question was uh i'm just wondering if panelists and others are examining the impact of the consultation on equality law and human rights as well as looking at privacy rights Sorry, Saj, do you mind just quickly repeating that? Absolutely. Um, just wondering if panelists and others are examining the impact of the consultation on equality law and human rights, as well as looking at privacy rights. Certainly the analysis we've done has tried to show how discrimination arises directly from the kinds of proposals that are talked about. So to take an example, when a business conducts use of its data, a lot of the time they don't use consent, they use the fact that they've got legitimate business interests. And that's called legitimate interests. The government does the same when it is doing you know, uh, things for public purposes. They're essentially relying on a kind of legitimate interest and they have to do a balancing test uh, to understand the impact on the individuals. And that includes the equalities issues, uh, the discrimination issues, the unfairness and so on that might arise. Um, so we've tried to do our framing of this in that kind of way. I think what it, if, it, if we're talking about it more widely, what it does is it takes away, because it takes away the necessity to understand the, inter it, the impacts on individuals when you use data and to, you know, to, to, to assess that because, or even to have regard for it, because it takes all of those things away. It means that you have to rely on either discriminate, uh, you know, equalities legislation or human rights challenges when breaches occur. And that, of course, is a much harder thing than showing that data protection law hasn't been abided by. So while it doesn't, uh, you know, directly get rid of those frameworks, what it does is it takes away a whole raft of protections which stop you ever having to rely on, on these much more uh, serious challenges um, when, when breaches occur. So I, th I think that's how I would um, phrase it. I think data protection breaches is essentially quite a relatively easy thing to show uh, compared to some of those other things and certainly to uh, mounting human rights privacy challenges. Thanks, Jim. And I think because we are for now, I'll just ask one last question, um, to, what, give one last question to the panel. The question was, um, could any of the panelists speak to the legal status of MOUs for data sharing between government departments and what forms of oversight are in place of these arrangements? Uh, I can probably speak a little bit to yeah. it, although of course the, uh, the lawyer's answer is always that it depends. I, you know, we need to know more about the exact circumstances of the case, but what I've hoped to show in my presentation today is that there are all of these building blocks. There are key principles like accuracy, like transparency, like purpose limitation, and then there are specific obligations and specific rights that individuals have. And all of these things provide, let's say, a useful point of inquiry. So for example, um, from listening to Malaya, it sounded like there was quite a, a lack of transparency about how that MOU was unearthed in the first place. So you know, considering how the transparency principle might apply in that situation um, would be a useful point of departure. Um, again, purpose limitation when you have a situation where data that was collected originally for one purpose and is being shared for another purpose, um, considering the facts and how they map against those principles is uh, really useful as a, a starting exercise. And in terms of data sharing, um, um, where there's one or more um, government department involved in data sharing, it is very possible that you would have something 
which is called a joint, joint controller relationship under Article 26 of the GDPR. And when that arises, there are specific um, even more obligations on data controllers, and they need to be very transparent about the nature of that data sharing arrangement, not necessarily to the extent of having a contract in place, but absolutely making the essence of the arrangement and what's happening available to data um, to individuals in a transparent manner. So um, I'll stop there, but there are lots of different entry points where you can start to maybe unpick that, that web. If I could just add, I think it's important to understand, particularly if there's a memorandum of understanding in terms of an arrangement between bodies, it still has, to, that is subject to public law legal concepts. It still has to be coherent and actually make sense in terms of the policy that it's seeking out to do. Um, and it also sits within the ever broader frameworks of, 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 of law. So it's, you know, the GDPR allows us to get hold of that, and then you have the GDPR framework that then protects around what it is, but that also means that we can then look at it and then consider that within a broader public law question and more of that kind of discussion. Um, so I just, yeah, just wanted to add, add that to the mix. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, so I think we're just, well, it's five past four now, so we, we shall have to end. But thank you very much to Stephen for chairing the event. And thank you very much to the panelists. And I would encourage you to get in touch with um, Org and the other panelists um, if you are considering making a submission. Um, we're happy to support you in whichever way we can. Um, so yeah, so please don't, um, please do get in touch with us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for a very useful session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Just one Thank last you. thing on that link is uh, the briefing. We'll, we'll be adding more briefing material to that link, but uh, that, that's where you can find all the, the details it is now.